Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor of ClassicsToday.com, and we are back in the overflow room for my ideal list of Haydn's Paris symphonies. Now, we've already done the London symphonies, 12 symphonies by 12 different conductors. This is a little easier. It's only six symphonies by six different conductors. But I have to say, it's tr just as tricky in its way because, you know, Haydn's Paris symphonies tend to come in clumps because there are only six of them. A lot of conductors have done them. And, you know, if you can, like, be a little bit strategic with the handling of repeats, you can squeeze them onto two discs, compact discs, which is quite handy. But the Paris symphonies are quite different in some ways from the London symphonies because Haydn's Haydn's trajectory as a composer was one of continuous growth. Growth. You might say that when he did the Paris symphonies, he was in his Beethoven phase. And then when he did the London symphonies, he was almost in his Mahler phase because his handling of the orchestra becomes so much freer and it's so different. But the Paris symphonies are critically, critically important works. They were composed in the in the middle of the 1780s when Haydn's you know, creative power was at its very zenith in terms of developing the, the new classical style. And these were really the first public symphonies that he wrote. You know, the rest of his work before then was for Castle Esterhaza and his patron, Prince Nicholas. And, and they were written for very small orchestras in, in private performance circumstances. Although he'd had the opportunity to play you know, some of them elsewhere, that's basically what they were. That doesn't mean that they're small or that they're small scale or that period instrument groups that try to replicate the size of the Esterhaza Orchestra don't do them a terrible injustice by playing them with such tiny, tiny forces. But the Paris symphonies are big, really big, deliberately so. You're talking about, you know, he was talking about 40 violins, 10 and basses, all the wind parts doubled. These are large works, really large works in a way they're the first modern symphonies. You might want to call them that, as we understand the term, for public concerts. And, you know, they really work best, I have to say, when played by large symphony orchestras on modern instruments. They really do. I mean, they might as well have been written for those forces because, because the music just blossoms. It has so much weight and substance and power when played that way. And when most period instrument groups play them, they sound anemic. It's that simple. I mean, some of them are quite good. I mean, Franz Bruggen, for example, does excellent work in the Paris symphonies. I love his performances. But on disc, you can make the orchestra sound bigger than it really is. And even, even so, they're a little bit small scale. There are some conductors, and we're going to get to them, who understand how to play the music irrespective of what type of instruments are chosen. But if a period instrument group is really serious, I mean really serious about doing the Paris symphonies, they're going to do it with an orchestra of 60 to 80 people. It's that simple. And none of them do. They don't do it for financial reasons. It's, that, you know, I mean, who are we kidding? This has nothing to do with authenticity. It's all about money. <laughs> money, folks. That's what talks. That's what determined everything in Haydn's day, our day. It's financial. So the best performances of the Paris symphonies, I have to say, unhesitatingly, are the ones that tend to use larger forces, and that means modern instruments. And the music sounds marvelous that way. And we're going to talk about them a little bit individually and, and see uh, how we go. So let's get right to it. These are numbers 82 through 87. A bunch of them have nicknames, which means, of course, that the ones that have nicknames are more popular than the ones that do not have nicknames. Unfortunately, that means that the very best of them, which is number 86, which does not have a nickname, usually gets ignored, which is just tragic. Absolutely tragic, because it's just an astonishingly great piece of music. And we'll talk a little bit about it when we get to it. Well, let's start with number 82. In keeping with my theory that the Paris symphonies work best on modern instruments with large orchestras, really large orchestras, for the bear, 
number 82 is nicknamed the bear because the finale is supposed to be a dancing bear. I mean, Haydn had no idea. <laughs> that's what it was, but that's what subsequent generations have called it. And for the bear, I go for the bear. Carrion! <laughs> At the Berlin Philharmonic, this cycle is a shocker because while Carrion's London symphonies are, are quite soggy and heavy, I think, and, and somewhat flat, his Paris symphonies were wonderful. And nobody expected this. I mean, it was Carrion, it was Berlin, it was the Carrion sound. It's all wrong for Haydn. But it says something about the scale and the way that the Paris symphonies are written that they work so well when played by Carrion and the Berlin Philharmonic. And his recording of The Bear is just a knockout. You have an option in, the, in this symphony to use horns or trumpets or both. And of course, you should always use both. You should always use the largest possible forces that Haydn wrote for because that's what does the music justice. It's really, it's such a simple thing. The idea that there could be theories that sort of go in the other direction, I find kind of mind boggling because if the purpose of a recording is to present the music in its most ideal setting, in keeping with the composer's optimal intentions, then you're gonna do everything that he suggested that you do. And Karyan does, and boy, is this an exciting performance. It's big, it's massive. And the finale, which is, you know, the dancing bear, but it, it, it's a folk tune type thing over a drone bass, like a bagpipe bass. And you really want it, you really want it to sound rustic and, and, and to, to grind out. And Karyan and his forces really do it. It's, it's a shocker. It shocked the hell out of me when it first came out. But Karyan for number 82. Now, number 83 is The Hen, but it's in G minor. It's a minor key symphony that's actually one of the funniest things that Haydn ever wrote. And it's a monothematic sonata form first movement. It's really just fascinating how Haydn develops this tragic opening. I mean, a really tragic, tragic opening into something which is completely silly and comic. It's a barnyard poultry waddle in the second subject. And again, in keeping with the idea that larger forces work better with this music, in each case for a different reason, and I'll tell you what the reason is. I mean, in the, in the bear, it was because you want the bear-like finale and also the militant opening to really, really rattle, rattle the windows, you know? Well, here we don't have trumpets and drums, but we do have an incredibly sort of tragic opening, and the contrast with the the comical poultry waddle second subject has to be huge. You can't make it too big. You really can't. And you want that, that anguished opening to really, really sound like something desperate is going on because that makes it all the funnier when something desperate isn't going on. So my choice is Kurt Sanderling. Kurt Sanderling with, with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. This is on on RCA, and you may find this almost impossible to find now, but archivemusic.com has it. Um, you can get it from them. And I, I mean, I don't even see this on Amazon anymore, anywhere. But, you know, you can look around. It, it, this is a wonderful, wonderful set of Paris symphonies for big orchestra. And of course, Sanderling, who took everything very seriously, takes the music very seriously, even the humor, which makes it even funnier. These are incredibly, incredibly rich, passionate, romantic performances, which is what the music really is. And so it's just fabulous to hear it done that way. And so for the hen, la poule in French, I go for sandaling on RCA. And you should too. Next, now we're going to do, we're coming up now to, let's see, number 82, 83, and 4. In E-flat, it doesn't have a nickname, which means nobody cares about it, which is a pity, because it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work. And of all the period instrument flavored performances, but still with modern orchestral forces, I go with Thomas Fye on Hensler. This is a terrific series of Paris symphonies. You know, Fye's Haydn cycle was rather tragic. I, you know, he. He began like gangbusters. He really did. There, and this was toward the beginning. These are some of the best performances. As it went on, he got more and more mannered and kind of weird and crazier. And and especially in the slow movements, he got more and more sort of periody with no vibrato and and and, and you know less and less expression, but a lot more 
futzing around, as they say in Yiddish, with the with the tempi and and pauses and rhetorical gestures, and it it all became very very mannered and artificial. And then he had a, a terrible debilitating accident. He fell down a flight of stairs in his house, and now he's he's no longer performing at all. So this was another Haydn <laughs> wannabe Haydn symphony cycle that was subject to the Haydn symphony cycle curse. It was destined never to be finished. But uh, one of the best mementos is this set of Paris symphonies. And his number 84 is, is, is quick and, uh, you know, but not ridiculously so, and expressive still, and wonderfully played, and just exciting. It's, it's a wonderful set, it really is. And so I can recommend that without any hesitation. Number 85 is La Reine de France, the Queen, Marie Antoinette's favorite. I mean, isn't it kind of cool when you can write these things and have the Queen tell you this is my favorite one? It really is delightful. It's largely on account of the second movement, which, which is uh, a set of variations on a French folk song. But never mind. The best performance is Chandor Weig. Chandor Weig with his his Camerata Mozartium Academica, whatever the hell they're called, the Camerata Academica of the Mozartium of Salzburg, whatever. This is a live recording from the Salzburg Festival. And as with his Mozart, his Haydn just sings. It is so soulful. It's so intelligent. It's so beautifully phrased, so elegant, so 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 rhythmically vital, so alive. I mean, what can you say about Chandor Weig? I mean, this stuff is just great. And Haydn 85, it's the only one of the Paris symphonies he did um, in this series anyway. And so I, I recommend it very, very strongly. And you also get numbers, numbers uh, let's see, 88 and 96, which are just, you know, terrific. So Chandra Vague for La Reine de France, 85. Now, 86, as I said, 86 is probably the greatest of the series for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, it's another one of those symphonies with trumpets and drums. It has the most amazing slow movement, just an astonishing, astonishing slow movement. You know, the movement consists of, it's almost Brucknerian modules, musical modules of, you know, thematic content. And they, they, they rotate, they come around and alternate. I mean, it, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's like in, in my book on Haydn, I talk about it, it's like walking through a sculpture garden at different times of the day and looking at the objects with the light reflecting on them and the shadows falling in different directions. It's such an incredible musical experience. And the other thing about 86 is that most people play it too fast, especially period instrument people. They really do. And, you know, this is one of those pieces that the music itself tells you what the tempo it has to be. There's no question about what tempo it has to be. Why? Because the opening theme of the first of the first movement is but the bump 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 is for full orchestra, the whole orchestra, and the bottom is just violins. So it's like that, right? And if you play it too fast, you can't hear the tune. You don't hear the violins. This tells us two things about what Haydn expected in this music. Number one, you need as many strings as you can possibly get, or you have to mic them very closely in a recorded situation. Otherwise, you're not going to hear the violins. So you're not going to hear the theme. You're going to hear a theme that consists of five note modules, the first two of which are always missing. And that drives me nuts as it's craziness. It's just unmusical to do it that way. You've got to have a performance that allows you to hear the damn tune. And if you can't hear the damn tune, either you don't have enough strings or you're playing it too fast. It's one or the other or both. And the period instrument people play it very quickly. And in fact, if you look at you know some of the most recent research on this topic by scholars like Beverly Gerald, who I cannot recommend highly enough, her book, Performance Issues, you know, 1600 to 1800, talks about this. And one of the things she has, she discovered, and I think demonstrates beyond any cavil, is that Beethoven's metronome marks are all this nonsense notwithstanding. Modern period instrument groups play all this music much too quickly. They play it more quickly than it possibly could have been done in the day, that the instruments weren't capable of playing at these tempos, 
And more, you'll find that the music needs to breathe, that, that contemporary sources despised metronomic performance. And of course, the metronome hadn't been invented. And because of that, there was no such thing as a metronomic performances, performance. Tempos had to be rather free. And what's more, they had to fit themselves to the shape of the melody. And in this particular case, the shape of the melody in that first movement dictates the tempo at which the music has to go. So most period instrument performances, as I've said, just get it wrong, and it's just awful when they do. But one guy gets it right as rain. Bruggen also, tends, I think, tends to get it pretty well, do it pretty well. But the guy who really gets it right is Harnenkor! This was the set that I did a totally separate talk about, a review about the, the greatest set of Paris symphonies out there, along with Bernstein's coming up. And, and this is a great performance of 86. And it's a great performance of 86 because, among other things, he really hits the tempos. Fast is fast. It's quick but it's not breathless, and you hear the tune. And the impression of movement, of energy, of, of forward progress is greater at a slower tempo where you hear the tune and the rhythm of the tune than it is at a quicker tempo, tempo where everything is just a blur of blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's supposed to be. Harnacourt for 86. Finally, we get to 87. Now, 87 is another one that everybody ignores. Everybody ignores it. I don't know why. It's gorgeous. It has one of the most beautiful melodies in the finale. Oh, it's gorgeous. And when the flute comes in and plays it, it's like a, a breath of spring air blowing through your room. It's wonderful. But the opening, the opening requires bass lines. It's another reason you need to have a big orchestra. You gotta have a lot of basses. You gotta have a bass line. The opening is chum pa 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 bum 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 pa da 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 da. But on the bottom, it's going chum 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 chum. It's 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 pumping like it it should it should it should be absolutely absolutely like 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 a cosmic engine pushing the music along. You've got to have a full orchestra with enough strings to give weight to that bass line. And the guy who has never had a better bass line is Bernstein, the other totally great set of Paris symphonies that you have to own. You have to have Bernstein. You have to have Harnacourt. And I would argue you should have Carrion, too. Those three, let's say. And then you're great for complete sets of Paris symphonies. But in my ideal list, Bernstein's performance of 87 has never never been surpassed, not by anybody. It is extraordinary, and it's extraordinary on account of the balances, on account of what it tells us about Haydn's orchestration, even the simple opposition between upper and lower strings. They have to balance. They have to be big, big, you hear me? You know, I, I, I'm very, very, very tired of this small-scale Haydn that's getting passed off as authentic when the only excuse for it is financial. It really is. It really is. There's no artistic justification for it, even some of the earlier works. If, if any of you have read Bayo's Violin Method, you know, he, he gives as an example, um, one of his examples of, of performance practice, the slow movement of Haydn Symphony No. 44, the Trauer Symphony, you know, Mourning. And the slow movement is absolutely gorgeous. And Bayo says straight out, Bayo knew Haydn. <laughs> you know, he knew these people. He says, boy, this sounds really better with a really large string section on the, on the violin line. You know, you need to have lots of violins. And, you know, I've seen comments on that remark that say, well, you know, it was just his typical expression of French grandiosity. And you know, far be it for me to suggest that the French can't be grandiose and don't like grandiosity. But, but the point was that, that some of this music has an inherent bigness, irrespective of the forces that it's written for. And, and in that context, in the orchestral context, it sounds better when you use more people. And you still have to make it balance and all of those things. But the music really comes into its own. And so 
That is my idealist for the Paris symphonies. Whatever the performers do, however large the actual ensemble, whatever their, their, their interpretive biases may be, the music has to sound big, big, grand, public, and there's nothing wrong with a little French grandiosity here and there, you know? It's not always a bad thing, especially when it's what the composer clearly, clearly had in mind. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for your time, your attention, your indulgence. Enjoy Haydn's Paris symphonies. Oh my God, they're marvelous. Take care.